Tonight on the Green Swindle, a special edition of Hannity. Now, liberals have told us for years that if we don't adopt their policies and give them more control over our lives, environmental Armageddon will be just around the bend. Now, they say science is on their side, and there's nothing left to debate. Tonight, we will expose some glaring errors in this so-called science and show you how scientists, politicians, and big business have turned global warming hysteria into a multi-billion dollar industry. But first, how environmentalism turned into fear-mongering over the climate, and we start at the beginning of the green swindle. The planet has a fever. The threat from climate change is serious, it is urgent, and it is growing. Global warming hysteria is spreading across the country. The entire relationship between humanity and our planet has been radically altered. People live in fear that the planet will perish unless they drastically alter how they go about their daily lives. But how did the issue of preserving the environment dissolve into the present day global warming fear mongering? Now to understand how the movement became so distorted, experts say we can look at certain events in history. The modern environmental movement sprang up in the 1960s and very early 1970s. And it represented a, a huge, a wholesale break with the traditional conservation movement that existed in America for about 100 years. Two significant books were published in the 1960s that made the modern environmental movement what it is today. In 1962, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, was released. In the book, Carson condemns the overuse of pesticides. Aerial spraying of pesticides should be brought under strict control. Al Gore wrote that Silent Spring had a profound impact on his life. Indeed, Rachel Carson was one of the reasons why I became so conscious of the environment and so involved with environmental issues. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, uh, is often credited with paving the way for the uh, environmental movement. It was just a time when there was a challenge to authority stemming partly from the Vietnam War, the sense that the leadership of the country might be taking us in wrong directions. That was carried over then to environmental uh, issues as well. And this was read widely uh, by people across the uh, nation and particularly by students. Uh, this was during the period where the uh, student revolution was uh, breaking out in the United States. Instead of always holding up Chairman Mao's little red book as their Bible, uh, they just rediscovered uh, Rachel Carson's little green book. And then in 1968, Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, argued that, quote, we must rapidly bring the world's population under control. Now, Ehrlich predicted that overcrowding was causing the world's environmental problems and would lead to mass famine. On the cover, it reads, quote, while you're reading these words, four people will have died from starvation, most of them children. These books are bestsellers because they foretell doom and gloom. And, and the population bomb was all about doom and gloom. And most of what Paul Ehrlich, in fact, if not all of what Paul Ehrlich wrote, has been uh, disproven over time. In his book, Ehrlich suggests that the government should allow, quote, voluntary sterilization for both sexes and give, quote, a series of financial rewards and penalties designed to discourage reproduction. People who got involved in movements like the anti-war movement, they found that it was in some ways an enjoyable experience. So when the war finally did wind down, they were looking for another crusade to join. These two books were instrumental in the creation of Earth Day. It was on April 22nd, 1970. That same date happens to be the birthday of Lenin. A lot of folks will tell you, oh, well, that's just a coincidence. But there were a lot of the young radical environmentalists at the time who thought this was really, this was really clever. This was an in-your-face to capitalism. An estimated 20 million people participated in that first Earth Day festivities across the country. And so the environmental hysteria began. The fear of global cooling started in the 1970s. Now, a cover story in the 1975 issue of Newsweek magazine elevated the hysteria to a national level. Now, oddly, these fears would eventually morph into global warming as the science indicated that the temperatures were rising and not falling. But in the coming decade, the movement would mesh with politics, leaving environmentalists at a crossroad. Patrick Moore was one of the founding members of Greenpeace. Around the mid-1980s, the environmental movement was basically hijacked by the political left. And at the same time, the Berlin Wall came down, communism ended, and a lot of peaceniks who were basically anti-American and leftist in their orientation moved into the environmental movement, bringing their sort of neo-Marxism with them. 
and they learn to use green language in a clever way to cloak agendas that basically have more to do with anti-capitalism and anti-globalization than anything to do with science or ecology. Patrick Moore left Greenpeace in 1986. I left Greenpeace really for two reasons. One was the larger issue that I wanted to get out of just pure confrontation politics, just telling people what they should stop doing, and start to work with people to find solutions for the environment and sustainability. And when the environmental movement became so strongly politicized left against right, it was time for me to leave. But it wasn't just environmental groups that began pushing their political agendas. This really got going in, uh, officially in Washington in 1988 when James Hansen, who is a, a scientist at NASA, came and testified in front of Congress about global warming and claiming that it was, it was a big issue, that it was real. This was what put this on Congress's radar. And from there, the movement began to inflate the political dialogue. Up until probably the middle of the 1990s, you had all these environmental groups out there and they all had their own concerns and their own causes and they had to pick their spots. And in 2006, the poster child for global warming came out with his now infamous movie. Here's Manhattan. The World Trade Center Memorial would be underwater. Think of the impact of a couple hundred thousand refugees and then imagine a hundred million. For some reason, uh, the combination of people's desire for entertainment and for celebrities has one after another brought people to the forefront as heroes, such as Al Gore, such as Paul Ehrlich, who really, you know, don't necessarily have all the answers. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Al Gore is not a scientist. He hasn't got a scientific bone in his body. He's a politician. He's a mass mover of propaganda. You know, Al Gore's uh, movie came out, and, and again, it was suddenly all over the popular culture, and you had a guy who was out there that everybody knew, and he became the sort of the face of this that simply raised public awareness of this. And this brings us to present day, where global warming is not necessarily a movement anymore, but actually an indisputable fact. They have basically taken the science out of it, and in, in, instead, there's this mixture of sensationalism, misinformation, and fear. Politicians around the world cite its work to support their historical claims, but how did this panel come into being, and how objective is its science? The Nobel Peace Prize for 2007 is to be shared between the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and Al Gore Jr. for their efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change. The International Panel on Climate Change, known as the IPCC, founded by the United Nations in 1988. Now its findings have been used to justify some of the most extreme claims about global warming. But how did this group become so influential? Contrary to its portrayals in the mainstream media, the IPCC conducts no scientific research. Rather, it was founded to promote international climate agreements. It was chartered to support a possible future climate treaty. So that's what they do. To understand the radical approach of the IPCC, all you need to do is look at its inspiration, the controversial UN bureaucrat, Sir Maurice Strong. Mr. Strong, what do you want to achieve in this trip? It all began in the mind of one ambitious, very rich civil servant, who was one of the faction of the UN that has always hoped that the UN could eventually be turned into a world government. Inspired by a vision of the UN running the world, Strong viewed democracy as an obstacle. He argued that, quote, our concepts of ballot box democracy may need to be modified to produce strong governments capable of making difficult decisions, particularly in terms of safeguarding the global environment. Using a global warming platform, Strong tried to force nations to give up their sovereignty. He went on to propose a global tax on the use of oceans, the atmosphere, and outer space. The problem is that if you really take global warming as something that you have to stop right now, that gives you entree into virtually every aspect of a person's life. With the IPCC's philosophy rooted in such radicalism, it is no surprise that the group has stopped at nothing to sell its agenda. The evidence is now overwhelming that the world would benefit greatly from early action and that delay would only lead to costs in economic and human terms 
that would become progressively high. The panel claims to reflect the beliefs of a so-called scientific consensus. The notion of science by authority is kind of stupid and counter to science as it's supposed to be conducted. Only uh, the politicians want science as a source of authority. The IPCC sells its agenda through assessment reports. Now these reports push for international treaties to curb emissions by painting a picture of environmental Armageddon. The group issued reports in 1990, 1995, 2001, and 2007, and a fifth report is underway. But critics object to how these reports are compiled. The scientists who are the lead authors on the IPCC are nominated by their governments. And so therefore, uh, the governments say that this represents science as we see it. Once the authors are chosen, they survey the scientific literature and claim to reflect it in their reports. They cherry pick literature conclusions. They extend their window for what literature is acceptable for consideration if there's a paper that they think helps and they ignore papers that don't. Patrick Michaels experienced the IPCC's bias firsthand. They initially said that they would keep a paper of mine out even if they had to redefine what the peer-reviewed literature was. So they were bound and determined to have a point of view come through and they succeeded. The IPCC's reputation has also come under fire for a series of errors contained in its reports. The interesting thing about those errors is that they all point in the same direction towards creating a problem where there isn't one and towards prodigiously exaggerating it where there is. This is a graph used in the IPCC's first and second assessment reports. It shows what scientists refer to as the medieval warm period during which temperatures were as high or higher than they are today. Now, if true, this cast doubt on the idea that humans cause global warming. Shockingly, the medieval warm period was removed from this graph, which became the iconic image of the panel's 2001 report. Instead of a big bump in the medieval period, as there had been in the 1990 report of the IPCC, and then much lower temperatures ever since, they straightened out the bump and they produced a huge increase in temperature in the 20th century. Even more troubling was a finding in the IPCC's first assessment report that the warming we have witnessed over the past few decades could, quote, be largely due to natural variability. The scientists who contributed to the second assessment report came to a similar conclusion. Now, the UN's bureaucrats realized that if a second report came out saying, actually, there's no discernible link between human activities and climate change, then people would begin to say, why are we paying for all these junketings around the world every three months? When the second assessment report was published in 1995, all of the uncertainty about how much humans have actually contributed to global warming was removed. The copy that came out after peer review was stopped said, the balance of evidence suggests there's a discernible human influence on global climate. It was changed after the peer review process. Errors in the IPCC's most recent report, published in 2007, seem almost amateurish. The 2007 IPCC report said, among other things, that all the ice in the Himalayas, all the glaciers, would be gone within 25 years of today. The lead author of that chapter knew that that figure was incorrect, they didn't mean 2035, they meant 2350, and even then, it's not going to be gone by then either, but that's what they said. Among the sources cited in the latest IPCC report, a student thesis, an environmental pressure group's press release, and a feature article in a popular climbers magazine. The head of the IPCC, Rajendra Pachari, refuses to apologize yes, for the report's I'm numerous sorry. errors. I have no intentions of resigning from my position. I was elected by acclamation um, by all the countries of the world, and um, I have a task. Hopefully Mr. Pachari and his group take things more seriously as the IPCC prepares its next report due out in 2014. Coming up, Al Gore leads the charge for an international climate agreement that would cripple the American economy.